Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Elizabeth, for the music. That was lovely. Thank you. Uh, you can't see this, but Martin and Jill have joined us uh, so that Jill can play uh, that beautiful prelude. Thank you. We love our musicians here at Grace, and hopefully as we begin to regather in small numbers, uh, we'll begin to utilize our talents in that way. So if you play an instrument or sing a solo or bang on a drum, you know, talk to Elizabeth. We'll find a way to work you in, won't we? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you may notice that I'm standing a couple inches closer to the phone. Uh, so I wanted to let you know that the adapter that I use for my phone is still at home. So we don't have the same microphone set up. So I wanted to make sure the audio is pretty good. Um, so you should be able to hear me. I know that you were able to hear Jill. Um, and we are recording this separately, so I'm hoping to weave those sounds together by the time that this posts again on YouTube. So hopefully that explains everything. Uh, before we begin, uh, we have a member among us uh, who, uh, without naming names, received a bad diagnosis this week. And I know that they are in uh, a lot of fear and anxiety, and uh, we will say a quick prayer for them uh, knowing that God is with them, that God is present with them, to ease their fear and to bring them into wholeness. But this prayer also might be a prayer for you this morning. Let us pray. O Father of mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, we humbly beseech thee to behold, visit, and relieve thy sick servant, for whom our prayers are desired. Look upon her with the eyes of thy mercy. Comfort her with a sense of thy goodness. Preserve her from the temptations of the enemy, and give her patience under her affliction. In thy good time, restore her to health, and enable her to lead the rest of her life in your fear and to thy glory and grant that finally she may dwell with thee in everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Morning prayer for this third Sunday after Pentecost begins in the Book of Common Prayer. And I've just lost my bullet then. Give me a minute. Uh, begins on page 79. And of course, the best way to follow along is through the full text bulletin, which you can find at gracelynchburg.org. And all of a sudden my tablet does not want to unlock, so we'll worry about that in just a second. But we will begin on page 79 after the opening sentence. The hour is coming and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for such the Father seeks to worship him. that it's important is because you will notice that the confession is different than what is on page 79. This is from the supplemental parts of the prayer book that aren't in that printed version. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness and in each other and in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The invitatory psalm this morning is the, the 19th, and there is an antiphon between each paragraph. Together. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with song. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. Come. Let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. The mercy of the Lord is everlasting. Come, let us adore him. The psalm for today is a portion of Psalm 69. And you can find it in the Book of Common Prayer on 680. And we'll say together verses 8 through 20. Surely, for your sake, I have suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you, at the time you have set, O Lord. In your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me. Neither let the deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me. Because of my enemies, deliver me. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. O Lord, you have enticed me, and I was enticed. You have overpowered me, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I must cry out, I must shout, violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become to me a reproach and derision all day long. I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name. Then within me there is something in my bones. I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is all around. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching for me to stumble. Perhaps he can be enticed and we can prevail against him and take our revenge on him. 
but the Lord is with me like a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble, and they will not prevail. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, you test the righteous, you see the heart and the mind. Let them see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of the evildoers. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first response is Canticle J, a song of Jonah. Let's say it together. I called to you, O God, out of my distress, and you answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I ever look upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep was round about me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land beneath the earth. Yet you brought up my life from the depths, O God. As my life was ebbing away, I remember you, O God. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. With the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. For deliverance belongs to the Lord. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized? death. Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Canticle 18. A song to the Lamb. Together. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so, to him who sits upon the throne, and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor, forever and forever. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve disciples, A disciple is not above the teacher, 
nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs on your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul makes it abundantly clear that when we step towards God, when we are brought from our own understanding of the world into God's understanding of us, that we move from a territory of sin and death into a territory of grace and life. We, by the very nature of our baptism, are joined to Christ's death in such a way that we die to ourselves and are raised with an identity given to us by God, given to us by the very nature of our coming to God through Jesus. But, you know, that idea of being dead to sin is something that, uh, when I first heard that as a child, I thought about it as, you shouldn't sin anymore. I'm a Christian now, so I shouldn't do certain things. And there is maybe a list of things that were considered bad, definitely something that somebody else might call a sin. And really, if you go around with your life with the right checklist and the right things checked off, you'll be okay. But that's not what he's talking about here. When he talks about dying to sin, he's talking about how we have translated into a new understanding of how we operate in the world. Following the way of Jesus is of being in our very flesh in this very world. You know, when I was younger, one of my favorite TV shows was Quantum Leap. I don't know if any of you ever saw that. Quantum Leap was this uh, uh, great show where this doctor uh, found himself in other people's experiences. In every episode, he was in a new body. Elizabeth, you remember that show? He was in a new body. And he would be experiencing that person maybe in another time, maybe in another uh, part of the, the country, part of the world. But he was fully that person, embodying them for that time. And he had to figure out what he had to do because he had to sort of set things right in that place and time before he could move on and he was hoping to get back home but he would always end up in another person's experience 
And I think that for me, one of the fascinating things about that, not only the time travel piece that always caught my attention, but the fascinating piece was the beginning. When he would first enter that person, a woman or a man, whether that person was white or black, whether that person was big or small, whether they were good or bad, he had to figure out as he went how to operate in that world. That's a little bit about the experience that Paul is talking about. That when we come into Jesus, we are placed in a new territory that is ruled by God's grace and God's righteousness. And we have to figure out how to walk in this world, navigating this world, knowing that we belong to another. And that's sometimes difficult. I think it's no wonder that in their experience of Jesus, the disciples had so many questions. Because he would say something that was so unlike the world around them that they had to stop him and say, Jesus, what, what did you mean by that? Do you really mean that this is the way that things are supposed to be? And sometimes they didn't get it at all. They made mistakes. They said, we don't know how to do that. And he would say, let's go through it again. Let me explain it again to you. That God is, and you yourselves are abiding in God and God is abiding in you and therefore you behave in this world as if you're enacting God's love. But it wasn't always pleasant as they went around the countryside preaching and healing and curing people. In fact, the passage that we had last week, remember? They said that as he was casting out demons, they said, surely he's the devil if he can command demons. If he can cast out the demons and the demons listen to him, surely that means that he's in line with the devil more than he's in line with God. And so now he's continuing to talk to his disciples and he's telling them, you don't belong to this world, but don't be afraid. They may call me Beelzebub. Think about what they're going to call you. Don't be afraid. That territory that he was sending them into was one where they could bring the peace of God, but even that wouldn't bring a particular kind of peace. That peace that they were bringing and walking with into the world was different than the peace that some people wanted. Some people wanted an absence of conflict. Some people wanted this person who's casting out demons and disrupting the system to just go home and behave himself. But Jesus said, and we don't quote this very often unless it's convenient to us. Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace to the earth, but a sword. And that's really heavy when you think about that coming out of the mouth of Jesus, this man of peace. Because we define peace sometimes as what is peaceful for me. The peace that Jesus promised, the peace that is beyond our understanding is one where that kingdom of God is filling the entire earth. That's a different kind of peace. But coming to God in a way that is countercultural to the dominant narrative around you isn't necessarily something that will be without conflict. We know that from our own experience, don't we? How many times have you been in a discussion with somebody that you disagreed with or been talking about the way of love that you're trying to walk on and somebody has a different view and instead of actually talking about it, everybody would just rather pass potatoes. Sometimes 
We skip those difficult interactions for the sake of what we call peace, but it's really no peace at all because we are still in conflict and in disagreement with one another. And that's what he's talking about. Coming to God, coming to this way of love in a world that does not understand that, it doesn't always feel like peace. He went around casting out demons and healing people, and they called him Satan. I wonder if there were some people that were maybe in my own terms, if we translated into a Christian language. Maybe they were good Christian folks. We know that the Pharisees were faithful people. The people that were watching him from a distance were faithful followers of God trying to their own lives. But maybe they were sitting on their porches watching him go by, just kind of shaking their heads and wishing he'd go home. You know, this life of faith is not really a spectator sport. When we are translated into that other world where grace and righteousness are breaking out, where God's kingdom is being established right here, sometimes the worst thing that we can do is just watch. And Jesus tells his disciples that you have a role in this. You have a part to play in what God is doing. Whatever I tell you in darkness, he says, you will tell in the light. What I whisper to you intimately, you will proclaim from the housetops. Proclaim from the housetops. I used to go and climb my roof when I was a child, when I wanted to really get away from people. When I wanted to hide, I didn't find a closet inside the house. I went outside. I climbed up this retaining wall over to the roof line, pulled myself up, and I would usually bring a backpack and some supplies and the towel and lay out on the, on the shingles, and I would watch the world go by. I would look over the crest of the roof at the neighborhood. Now, kind of jungle on the other side was the neighborhood and my friends and uh, maybe people that I knew, but strangers also. I felt like the whole world was out there. But if I had shouted from that place, if I had proclaimed something from that perspective, that vantage point, that would have been much different than shouting within my own house. Jesus is saying that part of our role as faithful followers is to amplify God's message of love into the world. We who bear God's image walk in this world proclaiming God to all corners. Proclaiming God's love to a world that is hungry to hear God's love. Especially right now. You may not have noticed, but a lot of people are crying for God's love. A lot of people are marching for justice. A lot of people are begging for God's love to actually be enacted instead of just being in words only. If we are a community of faith that follows the way of Jesus, these green stones that are on the outside of our wall should be painted with God's love, should be a beacon of God's love in this city. We see marches for Black Lives Matter, and instead of watching it unfold on the news, we should be leading the way. We see the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, which has been going on for several years, but culminating in a march and a call for moral revival yesterday. And instead of watching it online, we should be leading the way. In this month of pride for the LGBTQ community, who's been marginalized and pushed out by so many people of so-called faith, instead of 
watching them march and waving a rainbow flag, we should be leading the way for their justice and their inclusion and their love. Our role is to amplify the message of love that God has whispered to us. To share with those who are calling out for God, for, who are seeking God's justice. Because by our very nature of coming to God, we have been translated into a new world. A world where God's love is breaking out, where God's kingdom has come near. So we should buckle up. Because God is still moving. Even here. Even now. Amen. who are here in the room to stand as we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Help us, O God our Savior. Deliver us and forgive us our sins. Look upon your congregation. Give to your people the blessing of peace. Declare your glory among the nations and your wonders among all people. Do not let the oppressed be shamed and turned away. Never forget the lives of your poor. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you, and your favor to those who are true of heart. Satisfy us by your loving kindness in the morning. So shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. O oh Lord, Make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name. For you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set up for loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, who created us in your image, Grant us grace fearlessly to contend against evil and to make no peace with oppression, and that we may reverently use our freedom. Help us to employ it in the maintenance of justice in our communities and among the nations, to the glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray for the truth. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Teresa, Violet, Shelby, Lottie, Barbara, Lisa, Brandy, Pat, Betty, Joseph, Enid, David, Sue, Gloria, Nancy, Harley, Mary Louise, Betty, Jean, Bill, Jean, Jerry and Glenn, Skip, Bud and Chris, Annie Bob, Barbara, Gloria, and any others that we wish to remember now aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Give them courage and hope in their trouble and the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, especially those who have died alone that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you make us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Lord. Give us this day such blessing through our worship of you, that the week to come may be spent in your favor. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us say together the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all but above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Life is short, and we don't have much time to those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit fall freshly upon you and remain with you.